Once again, the question was, does anyone have two-factor authentication configured for the My Campus portal? There are uh, authentication apps that you can load on your smartphones. Like uh, there's a Google authenticator. There's also a Microsoft authenticator. You can uh, tie those in. Um, I don't know if our campus website includes two-factor authentication, but that is a topic for uh, significant of significant interest because your access to networked resources, uh, there's a big push right now when it comes to uh, how passwords are managed, how authentication is brokered, especially in single sign-on environments where a single login allows you access to all sorts of sensitive information in an enterprise. Uh, UVI has single sign-on uh, through its uh, pop-up and that allows you access to the portal, which in turn allows you brokered access into BandWeb, into Blackboard, into Bux Connect. It allows you access to licensed resources in Office 365 and um, server downloads and Azure for education, developer tools, and so on. Uh, this is something that you're intimately familiar with at this point, but I thought I would ask because one of the things that we're going to work in all of our cybersecurity classes is to examine and then implement two-factor authentication whenever and wherever possible. Uh, if UBI does not possess two-factor uh, options on their main website, we will take up as a class an interest to recommend and promote this feature for reasons that you will discover uh, later on this season. So I just thought I would ask that question before we started. Now in Blackboard, you'll notice that we did, um, we did post uh, the initial interests and I do not yet have, I do not yet have uh, the stuff that's in here for our class. This is just a template. And essentially what I'm going to do is, is uh, forklift the digital forensics interests out of here. So I wanted to explain that this is just a, a temporary placeholder. Um, our decision to adopt the tech textbook that we have now occurred last week. And so we're getting materials organized and we'll start populating these modules. For those of you that have been into the module one, and uh, been in here, I think, I think what we need to do for the time being is, is make this unavailable on, until we uh, exchange the previous content uh, with current content in the course. But I, I wanted to address that with you in class and actually record that for those of you that are joining us asynchronously so that, uh, you know this wasn't a mistake and it wasn't another uh, mix up on my part. So are there any questions about the module? What we, it does have the same title, Origins and Essentials, and there are some congruent interests. In fact, if we back up uh, to module one, understanding what is authentic and healthy and uh, the real McCoy is part of any forensic environment. So in digital forensics, we talked about a baseline. In intro to cyber, we talked about a baseline. In security, uh, in, in system security, we talked about a baseline. And that is also a, an interest in this course. Uh, it's just framed a little differently. So. You need to be able to identify. We're not gonna have the same learning objective that we did in digital forensics here, but we're going to refer to it. So it's, it's essentially, um, it, it's a critical skill set to know what's common and what's healthy. Let me share a case in point with you. All right, so we're gonna, we're gonna leave this screen for now. And then by Friday, 
you have my promise that this first module will be populated uh, with our stuff and our first assignments will be down here. Um, any questions at this point? No questions. All right. Can we still see the screen? No. Um, I wasn't sharing the screen at that point. I guess I don't I think you were. I, I don't think I was sharing the screen. Okay. How about now? Yep. Uh, yeah, we see the home screen, the right. desktop. I'm going to go ahead and change this to duplicate display so I don't have weirdness going on. Um, no. Supposed to be duplicate displays, keep the changes. So everybody can see the screens now, right? No, you stop sharing. Stop sharing. Uh, How about now? Yeah, we see it. Do you see the participants list? Yes. How about this participants list? The one I'm wiggling in the center of the screen? No. No? Okay, that's part of Zoom and meeting chat. All right. So what we're going to do here now is segue into our topic for the day. So <clears throat> the a significant part of your capacity as a network forensic specialist is going to uh, flow from and depend on your understanding of what a normal network environment is for your systems and on the network itself. Okay. Today we're going to be talking about uh, the client side of things on the devices and systems themselves. Uh, and then we'll also talk about what happens when hackers virtualize their tool set. This is a common practice. Both black hats and white hats, the good guys and the bad guys, uh, take advantage of virtual environments. And there is a, a distinct signature that presents when virtual tools are in the mix on a device or a system. Here you see that I installed Oracle Virtual Box on this system. This is the latest version of Virtual Box. I also installed the latest extensions. Is everyone familiar with what I mean by extensions? Yes, the toolkit stuff. Yes, it's like driver toolkits. That would be a good way of it is a toolkit and it's virtual drivers that map to real world drivers. So if we go to VirtualBox. Dot org and using methods that you're familiar with from system security and from intro to cybersecurity, we downloaded for another class the latest version of VirtualBox, then the extension pack, then checked the SHA-256 hash in order to ensure what? Anyone? What's the point of checking the hash for the download? To make sure that you have the correct. To see if it's legit. Yeah. Yes, to make sure that you have a complete and correct download, that it wasn't corrupted, but more importantly, that you didn't, in, you didn't get an, a hitchhiker. So oftentimes there are payloads that are embedded in downloads and the, uh, the folks who offer these resources are supposed to hash a clean copy, a pristine correct copy, and then publish the hashes so that you can do this. If you do not yet have a hashing tool on your personal technology, you're going to want to consider 
going to the Microsoft Store and downloading Hash Tool, right? Which is readily available on the Microsoft Store. And you, you're gonna wanna use that uh, constantly. So that is one thing that you're gonna wanna do to prepare your personal technology. Now, the next part of this I'm going to share with you uh, everybody remembers that on Monday we said you need the textbook, we're going to depend on the textbook, and you have to verify that you have a legitimate copy of the textbook. Did, did, does everybody recall that something like that from Monday by the end of this week? Yeah. Okay. Yep. All right. So I will post an assignment in module one asking you to do that. The other thing I'm going to do is ask you to walk through the steps of preparing your personal technology, optimizing your personal technology. Now, there'll be a handy link in the assignment, but essentially what we want you to do is to take a moment before we start everything for the semester. And maybe you do this routinely, maybe you don't. But if we go to YouTube, And you should be able to search for it pretty quickly. Um, so it'd be the VI Tech Shop. And inside the VI Tech Shop, if you search for videos, you should be able to find one that has to do with optimizing your personal technology. And of course it wouldn't show um, right off the top as I'm demonstrating in class. I, I will have the link in there for the assignment. In any case, oh, I think that might be the name of the assignment. And then the actual link is um, maintaining your personal technology. In any case, what you're going to do is update all of your applications. You're going to show that you've updated Windows. Uh, you will then perform two tasks after you've, you've uh, completed updates of the OS and all applications. Does anyone recall what those two tasks are? And I'll give you a hint, it has to do with your hard disk. So you, you'll reference uh, in the apps under settings, what, what uh, software is installed and see if there's any updates on that side of your operating system. Then you'll go to control panel and you'll go into programs and features. And you'll make sure that all of the stuff that's loaded on your system is updated. So you'll find it and you'll update it. Anything that's in there, once you've finished updating your applications, the software installed and the OS, and you've proven that your latest update is a certain build, right? So you go ahead and install and check. You're going to capture a screenshot more precisely on your system under about. You should see this build number or higher. Now, there might be subtle variations depending on whether or not you're dealing with Windows 10 Home Edition. We'll get, we'll check to make sure it's the same uh, consistent number, or we'll provide each of those separate. Uh, build numbers, but you'll need to be on version 22H2 if you're in Windows 10. If you're on Windows 11, I think it's 22H1 or 21H2. I'm not sure, uh, but we'll we'll provide the, the specifics. After you've completed all those updates, you're going to go into Control Panel and in administrative tools or off the start menu, you can search for disk cleanup and defragmentation. 
Now, it's important to note that when you're doing disk cleanup and defragmentation, you do not want to be running or multitasking three other things. So you're going to need to work from a different screen for a short time if you want to do this right. If you're doing disk cleanup and defrag while you're multitasking, you don't get the results. And I have found that apart from my promise that if you optimize your personal technology, you will experience an amazing increase in, in uh, screen performance. Half the time students are saying, well, I'm not seeing that. And the reason they're not seeing that is because they have all sorts of things embedded in their system that's running real time in the system tray that they don't really use, or they have a lot of screens open, or they have a couple of browsers with 47 tabs. Um, does everybody know what I'm talking about? So when they go to the performance side of the tab, what they see for memory is a pretty hefty consumption of memory. Now, the reason you're seeing a large consumption of memory in my case is because I'm I'm using Zoom to conference with you. I have a web browser open. I have Teams in the background for phone calls in case of emergencies. I've got another browser here. Uh, we've got Task Manager. So we're consuming half of our memory. But the point is, is that when you're running disk cleanup and defrag, you will not get the result you need unless you do that first, OK? Any questions about what we've talked about so far? There is a final measure that you're going to implement after disk cleanup is performed and after defragment is finished. There's one more step you want to take to maximize the performance of your host system, your personal technology. Does anyone remember the final adjustment we made? What we would do is reboot after. So here's the clue. After disk cleanup and optimization is completed, you want to reboot your system. And before you load any applications or start anything, you're going to make a single change to your file system. Does anyone remember what that single change was? The detailed view? Uh, it is helpful to modify the view if you haven't done that already. And that's actually not a bad thing to mention because and the defaults for most uh, systems don't include hidden items, file name extensions, and then under options, if you look at, you, you first select the PC so that it says this computer or my computer. I've named this computer RTP 129 STX because I'm going to be working on multiple systems and I don't want to get confused when I'm looking at File Explorer, right? So in your case, you'll see this computer or my computer, unless you've named your system. You've changed the name of the default name of your system. You're going to go into view. You can leave this top one unchecked, but all the other boxes should be checked. This should be selected as a radio button, and these should be unchecked. So that's what you want. The reason for doing so is that when you're looking in hard drives on your system, you don't want anything to evade you, especially file extensions or hidden files. So. Thank you for bringing it up, Sully. I appreciate that. Um, that's not what I was referring to, but in case you hadn't done that from previous classes in Intro to Cyber or Digital Forensics or any of the other uh, CSC classes we've had together, does anyone remember anything else about the final adjustment to your file system before, before you start working with virtual machines? I'm hearing crickets. Is it partitioning the drive? That's also a legitimate interest. So you can go into uh, computer management. Let's take a look at that one too, but that's also not, not the answer I was looking for, but it, but it is a worthwhile uh, consideration. If you're serious and you do a lot with virtual machines, you're gonna want a separate volume to use for the VHDs because the virtual hard disks are the largest and most prominent component of a virtual system. Those are typically stored on a, a user folder and it plays havoc on the uninitiated for virtual systems when OneDrive or the Google Drive is integrated with their file system, meaning their stuff is stored in the cloud. 
So in the user profile under documents, um, there are virtual applications that have a nasty habit of embedding the hard, the hard drives and other components of the virtual machine in the cloud. Um, one of the things you can do with disk management is that after you have optimized your system, you can shrink a volume. You can shrink it down some for the spare space that will leave an unallocated section, which you then can format using the largest two megabyte allocation unit when it's formatted. It's the difference between moving a household of digital contents using, um, using an 18 wheeler versus a moped with a basket. Let's repeat that. Ordinarily, the allocation unit size is intended for routine use by consumers. That means that the allocation unit default size is 4K. If you are loading a 20 gigabyte hard disk to start your virtual machine and you do it four kilobytes at a time, it takes forever. Does everybody understand what I'm talking about here? Yep. But if you have a two megabyte allocation unit on a separate disk, a lot of times when people get their laptops, they just go with what was installed at the factory and they don't make these changes. I happen to have, let's look at this. I happen to have 699 gigabytes free. I could shrink this volume by 240 gigs. I could do that. Then I could partition a logical disk. It would be drive letter D or E, depending on the letter scheme that I have. I could format it using two megabytes. That would be the ideal location to stand up a VHD directory where we store virtual hard disks. When they load, they load two megabytes instead of four kilobytes, right? So it is an order of magnitude faster and it allows you to really work efficiently. But that's, that's not quite what we wanted to do as our final adjustment. So that's a consideration. If you have extra hard disk space, and Sully, once again, thank you for bringing that up as well. If you have additional space, that is one more change you can make. But this one is the thing you do after disk cleanup, disk defrag, and you reboot the system before you're running any other apps. You go into system properties, right? So you can go into system properties and you're gonna go into the system properties and then go to about. And then on the right side, you have advanced system settings. What you will want to do is modify. You'll see hardware, you'll see computer name under the advanced tab. There's an opportunity to adjust for performance. I would recommend you leave windows to choose what's best for my computer on this tab. But if you really have a, a badass graphics card and you'd like to adjust for best performance, you can do so and you might gain quite a bit the only difference is a lot of things don't, even with a badass graphics card, you don't get the benefit of the badass graphics card when you do this. So if you do this, Windows will make decisions for you when and how your graphics elements on the screen. You might have other purposes for your laptop besides this class, right? So I tend to recommend now, um, like, you know, students were saying, oh, the screen elements are faint. And, my games, my, my online games suck. That's because they were doing this. If you go to the advanced tab, you have an opportunity. By the way, you can tweak the client operating system so that it behaves more like a server by selecting this radio button for background services. What am I saying? I'm saying that if you use a Windows PC as a dedicated server for, I don't know, putting a web page out there, and you want to maximize the performance of the applications, you would select this. But I wouldn't recommend it unless you had an extreme case. What I want you to notice here is that the paging file, the virtual memory has been changed. So what I've done is taken the number of, I've taken the number of gigabytes that the host system has, my personal technology has. In your case, it might be eight gigs, might be 12 gigs, might be 32 gigs. I doubled it. I got a calculator out, 
and I said, okay, I have 16 gigs of RAM. I'm going to multiply that by two. Then I'm going to multiply it by 1024 because that's the number of megabytes. I'm going to establish a, a paging file size or swap memory on my hard disk so that my RAM memory can breathe easy when I'm swapping out huge chunks of memory and data. I'm going to select, this is usually checked and that's grayed out, but what you're going to do is uncheck it, then select customized size, enter the initial size and the maximum size to the same value. You'll click set. If you do not click set, the change will, once again, if you do not click set at that time, your change will not take effect and we won't see this afterwards. You're gonna to wanna to show this screen and share this screen as a part of your submission for the assignment. So what we recommended in previous classes and were optional, we are not recommending as an option in this class. It is mandatory that you do these things with your personal technology to the extent that you can do them. Now, if you don't have extra disk space so you can shrink your volume and create a dedicated VHD, that's okay. But you should have enough disk space on your system to allow for twice the amount of RAM dedicated. Once you do that, you're gonna find that the size remaining in your disk drive shrinks by 32 gigabytes. So before I took this measure, we had 32 gigabytes more and it would fluctuate depending on what I was doing. We don't want Windows in this scenario to make decisions on the fly while you're multitasking, running a virtual machine, trying to analyze the network packets as you're capturing them with Wireshark, and then you're also running an Nmap scan. It gets pretty extreme. Does everybody understand what I'm talking about here? Now, what do you do if you don't have personal technology that's up to speed that's capable of doing this? Uh, after our class is over, you're gonna send me an email request that says, hey, talk to me about those virtual machines because we have dedicated virtual machines we can configure for you that will do this, that you can configure like this, that you can run when we're doing activities and solutions. And uh, all you have to do is have a screen, a keyboard and a mouse to access it. Um, so that's, that's one thing I wanted to mention. Okay, that is part of your optimizing personal technology. It'll tell you or should tell you when you say, okay, it'll say, hey, you got to reboot your system. If it doesn't say reboot your system, Make sure you click apply, right? If it doesn't say reboot your system, you should reboot your system just the same. And then you wanna go back in there and make sure it shows whatever change you made, 3232. You also wanna go back in and make sure that your hard disk space reduced by that amount. So you're sure the, the setting change took effect. At that point, you're ready to start working with virtual machines. Now I have VirtualBox installed, but if I look at my network environment, what should I see when I look at my network environment if I'm using and have already provisioned virtual machines? Anyone know? Does everybody see this? Yes. Yes, we see it. I have a virtual switch set up for Hyper-V. I enabled Hyper-V on my system because I have a, an edition of Windows that's professional edition or corporate edition or higher. I wanna be able to demonstrate Hyper-V methods on this system for a variety of classes, including this one. It's going, to, it's going to build out a virtual representation of a network interface. Otherwise, you wouldn't see this. You would see a wireless connection. You would see an ethernet connection especially if you're dealing with a laptop, but you wouldn't see these extras. I also installed VirtualBox. The same thing applies here. VirtualBox is gonna lay hold of your network interfaces and create its own virtual network interface with which to connect the virtual machines. This is one way you understand a system or device has been configured for use with virtual machines. So when you're doing IP config or IF config, on a Linux machine, right? And you use the all option to display everything, you'll see extra interfaces that aren't physically present. That's a sure sign that your environment is rigged for virtual. That's a good thing if it's yours and you know that's what you want. 
it's a very bad thing if it's an office machine that isn't intended for that purpose. And there it is. It means that somebody has a back door and they stage attacks or do things from that system. They use it as a pivot in the network environment to reach out and attack and exploit. And then they, they remove the virtual machines. Oftentimes they forget to remove the virtual components. So this is one thing you wanna check the dipstick on when you're working virtual, when you're working in a network environment to assess what's going on with a device or client. This gets down to the very idea that you have people who are uh, running with, um, excuse me, just a second. When you have uh, a network environment and you'd like to understand what's normal and not normal, it's a part of your baseline. This is a, a critical part of your baseline in network forensics, checking devices and systems or the presence of virtual interfaces when they're not supposed to be doing that, right? Any questions? Now, a hacker can um, change the settings in the virtual environment to embed their packets inside the stream of data from, from the host, so it's it's lost in the stream of data in the host, or they can operate in bridge mode. But either way, these virtual components will be present on the host. So it's so it's a telltale sign, and it's a layer removed from what most hackers uh, think to clean up after themselves, and that's uh, one aspect of it. Okay, so what we'll do right now is uh, stop sharing and stop recording. Are there any questions before we close out the class?